so now we are moving on uh, in our examination here of Rembrandt, who, uh, when he was at the age of 14, from 14 to 16, it was three years that he apprenticed to Jakob Isaac van Svanenberg, who was a, a very bad painter, to be honest. But he apprenticed for three years, uh, and his parents, who were well off, they weren't rich or anything, uh, but the, the, his father was a miller. They were comfortable, and they let they allowed him to do this. Um, he had other brothers that were involved with the military in various positions. Uh, so the father seemed like, oh, if you want to go be a painter at 14, go ahead. Um, his his friend Jan Levens, though, started even earlier at the age of eight. Uh, but he's nowhere near as good a painter as Rembrandt. Um, so that's his first apprenticeship. And we've lost all those paintings. So we don't have them from those three years. And this is going on in Leiden. And then so he decides that he wants uh, to apprentice to a better painter, Peter Lostman. And indeed, Peter Lostman in Amsterdam was a better painter by far than Svanenberg. So he went in at the end of, at about the age of 17, at the end of uh, 1624, to go and apprentice for six months with this guy up until about June of 1625. And um, now I have said that this first epoch lasts for seven years. Uh, from 1625 to 1632. But in this video, I'm only going to look at the first five of those years because there's so many paintings to talk about and I don't want the video to go too long. So we're just going to look at the first five years of this period. So um, then when he comes back to Leiden, he remains there for a while, uh, painting in Lastman's style all the way uh, through 25, when we have his earliest dated painting, The Stoning of St. Stephen. Uh, through 26, he's imitating his style. And then... Uh, he doesn't really find his own style until 1627 uh, when he starts breaking free of the pseudomorphosis of the influence of Peter Lostman. And now, so then here is one of Peter Lostman's history uh, paintings. He specialized in history paintings. Um, and this is called Coriolanus. And so note the, um, the horizontality of it. He tended to favor these large paintings going uh, with a horizontal axis. We have Coriolanus up on the top here giving his speech. And note the figures kneeling on the right-hand side. Keep those in mind. And then the horse and the soldier on the left-hand side. And this is uh, dated from 1622. And then so when Rembrandt, this is the earliest dated painting of Rembrandt's that we know of, 1625, The Stoning of St. Stephen. Notice that he has borrowed the horse from that painting here on the left-hand side with the rider sitting on it. Um, but uh, <clears throat> he's done something very different here. Already um, he's divided, already we have the interplay of light and shadow, which uh, Lostman simply does not have, where we have this uh, diagonal cu cutting sort of down the middle where the soldier on the horse is in a patch of darkness. And this darkness here, and then on the right-hand side, we have Stephen being murdered, stoned to death, He's Christianity's first martyr, St. Stephen Proto-Martyr, um, who was stoned to death uh, just a couple of years after Christ is crucified. I think it's 35 AD, and it's in the Acts of the Apostles. Um, and um, so we have this, this, uh, this darkening over here on the left-hand side, and that will grow and grow and grow through the course of Ruff, uh, Rembrandt's pictures. rather. Um, and then he's got this clearing here, uh, a sort of Heideggerian Lichtung in which truths are being made evident here. And he has painted himself uh, as St. Stephen. That's a, these are his first self-portraits. This one, and Simon Schama insists that the guy raising the stone up above his head is also him, and possibly even the guy back behind him. But I think it's really just uh, St. Stephen that that's, this is his earliest self-portrait. Um, and so note too, um, whereas Kenneth Clark in his book on Rembrandt, very strongly says Rembrandt was a rebel and gives lots of concrete examples to that effect. Um, his rebellion against the classical style of the Renaissance, uh, his rebellion against uh, Caravaggio and linear, uh, the linear painterly mentality that Heinrich Wolflin uh, describes. Um, whereas Simon Schama says, no, that's a myth. He's not a rebel. But uh, I'm afraid that Schama's thesis doesn't work here because this is a rebel. Stephen is rebelling against the Sanhedrin priesthood, um, saying he saw this vision of Christ uh, resurrected, risen in the sky, and he's stoned for it. So it is an act of rebellion. And that's important because in um, 
Oh, here's a later sketch. He went back in 1635, 10 years later, uh, and did a uh, an etching of it, not a sketch, uh, and did an etching of it where he's changed the geometry quite a bit. Um, it's just interesting to compare the later vision. And then, um, and then here's Christ driving the money changers from the temple, 1626, which emphasizes a vertical axis. Um, and in contrast to Lostman, even perhaps rebelling against him and one-upping him at every step. Every one of Rembrandt's Lostman-influenced paintings are better than the master. Um, perhaps not this one. Uh, it, it's a bit troubled. It has a zigzag axis cutting through it. Um, it's got vertical orientation. It, it's not an entirely successful painting, but it is interesting to look at the way he's wrestling with the figures. But this painting here which, uh, again, in, in Shama's book, says that uh, another scholar identified it correctly. It was originally thought to be Palamedes, uh, based on a play, um, but it's not. We're, uh, the scholars are pretty sure that it's actually Claudius uh, Civilis, uh, the magnanimity of Claudius Civilis, uh, which is significant because here is the theme of the rebel. Once again, Claudius Civilis is a rebel against the Romans, kind of like Arminius, um, and he is the leader of the Batavians, which the town of Leiden was a uh, was the center of the Batavians in the days of the Romans. And the Romans here, uh, or the Romans, not the Romans here, but but the group that is faithful here to the Batavian lo lord here, uh, Claudius Civilis. His name was actually Julius uh, Civilis in uh, Tacitus's histories, uh, which is great because his career goes full circle all the way down because. The giant uh, painting of the conspiracy of Claudius uh, Civilis is what he ends his career with, that he was going to do for the town hall. Um, but they rejected it, and he cut it cut it up, and we only have a fragment of it. Um, so this is very interesting. So he's borrowed, and notice too, on the left-hand side here, this pile of uh, relics and shields. This is the early, Rembrandt was a pack rat, a collector of antiquities, busts, shields, uh, suits of armor, uh, costumes. Um, that's what possibly made him bankrupt. And when he filed for bankruptcy in 1656, was he was a spendthrift. Uh, he's constantly spending money on on these kinds of goods. And here we already see that on the left hand side there. I note too the figure kneeling. Uh, that has also been borrowed from the Coriolanus painting of uh, Lostman, the kneeling figure. And then so this is 1626, still thoroughly under Lostman's influence. But he went up some, as I say, at every step. Um, this is 1623, a Peter Lostman painting, Baptism of the Eunuch, which significantly is a story that follows in the Acts. It comes right after the stoning of St. Stephen, which is about uh, Philip, the disciple, in Ethiopia, where he encounters uh, this uh, African individual and baptizes him. Um, I, this is a weak painting. I don't think there's anything particularly interesting about it. Uh, but when we look at Rembrandt's uh, version of it, 1626, uh, it's quite spectacularly better. And uh, astonishingly, for a young kid, he's what, 19 here, 1920, uh, to, to have this kind of self-confidence with the line. It's, it's very bold, crisp, chiseled, and linear. Um, and it is quite a bit more effective than uh, his master, Lostman. And then so here we have uh, another very bad painting by Peter Lostman, 1622, Balaam's ass, uh, balking at him, and he's beating the ass. This is from a, a, a story from the book of Numbers, where this Balaam fellow uh, is sent out by his master Balak to go and persecute the Jews. Um, and so God hears of this and then sends an angel, and here we have this pedestrian angel on the right-hand side, nothing special or interesting about him. Uh, threatening him, and the horse can see the angel, but he cannot, the angel with the sword, but he cannot, so he beats his horse for an, uh, failing to move. He does it three times, and the horse finally speaks English to him, or, or whatever, Aramaic, let's say, speaks in human speech, <laughs> is what I meant, uh, speaks uh, to him and says, why are you beating me? And then uh, uh, he has, uh, suddenly he's spiritually awakened, and now he sees so once again, we get the optical motif here with uh, the angel and the prophet Balaam from 19, 18, 1626 here by Rembrandt, again in the same style, very brightly lit, which is not Rembrandtian at all. And we have Balaam here, and as Shama points out in his book, his eyes are painted like caverns, because at this point he cannot see 
properly and clearly, that's say spiritually, he can see physically, he's not blind. But, uh, and Rembrandt does have this obsession with blind characters, as we'll see. So this painting is quite a bit more effective and striking. But we have that little abyss, it's there, it's present on the right-hand side with the two shadowy figures in the dark area, uh, this little chasm world that will engulf over time uh, the foreground figures of Rem Rembrandt's uh, paintings. And then so here we have um, the story now of Tobit, and this is uh, a print, I believe, by Jan van de Velde. Um, it wasn't something that was painted very often. We have uh, So this is an, another story that has to do with an old man where um, he is out. Uh, he had been making a living doing trading with the Medes, and this is the time of the Assyrians uh, when they have taken, when they have conquered the north in the 8th century BC and taken them to Nineveh, the Jews. And so he's a Jew living in Nineveh who has been making trade with the Medes. And then the Assyrians take all his possessions away from him. They just leave his son Tobias and his wife Anna. Anna's in here on the right-hand side. <clears throat> and so while he's taking a nap under a tree one day, because he doesn't want to go home because he had to bury uh, a Hebrew who, who had been strangled, and so he's defiled and unclean, so he has to, there has to be a period where he's out of the house, according to taboo laws. And so he's out there, and he has his eyes open, and these sparrows take a shit in his eyes, and it makes him blind. Nobody can, get, can clear his eyes. So he becomes blind, and then they don't have any money, so Anna goes and does some woman's work, and then she uh, gets paid with it uh, with a kid, a goat. And so here uh, she is coming in here on the right-hand side with the goat, and then he's accusing her of stealing it. Uh, he's like, well, go, you should be ashamed of yourself. And she says, no, I earned it uh, because we don't have any money. And then so what happens is he sends his son Tobias uh, to go and get to collect a debt that um, the Medes owe him. And then so he goes, and but he wants a companion to go with him. And so God has sent the angel Raphael in an avatar, a human avatar, so that nobody recognizes him as an angel who accompanies him on the journey. And so they go on the journey and they come to a river, the Tigris, which they want to cross over to cross over into the Zagros Mountains. And um, he says, the uh, angel tells him, go catch a fish. And uh, there's this giant fish that hops up and it threatens to swallow him. But he kills it. They cut it open, and the angel tells him, "Hang on to the heart, the liver, and the gall, because uh, we're going to need those." They eat the fish, uh, and he as the next day as they're carrying these dried goods with them. He, he says to the angel, "What do we need these for?" And the angel says, "Well, uh, because he is also another motive for the journey is to marry uh, a woman named Sarah, who has a curse on her because she has been betrothed seven times, actually married." But on the night of the, uh, the consummation, uh, the demon Asmodeus has bound and killed each of the lovers. So there's kind of a curse on her. So that curse needs to be removed as well as the blinding of Tobit, uh, Tobias's father. And he says, well, the heart, if we burn incense and we put the heart and the liver of the fish in it, it will uh, drive away demons and the gall can be used uh, for, to cure your father's blindness. So they continue on the journey. Um, they meet Sarah. Uh, the ritual does indeed work. Uh, Asmodeus goes away, and then they travel back, uh, back home to Tobias, who sees his daughter-in-law, Sarah, now. Uh, everyone's happy. They put the gall on his eyes, and he is able to see again. So that's the story in the apocryphal book of Tobit, which the Protestants, it should be noted, uh, in the Netherlands at this time had rejected the apocrypha. But Rembrandt, being the bibliophile that he was, with, with, with a pun on that word, um, he absolutely loved the Bible and, and just read it and studied it, and that was one of his favorite stories. So then we have his version of this print, which wasn't uh, an iconotype that was painted very often, if at all, um, other than that uh, that print there. Uh, and here she is bringing in the goat um, here on the right-hand side, and on the left he's uh, beseeching her to return it. She's obviously stolen it. But the other significant thing about this painting, which does date from 1626, is that we can start seeing the earliest of the Rembrandt brown, the metaphysical brown, coming in in a light layer here, and the emphasis now on interiors rather than Lostman's emphasis on exteriors. Everything in Lostman is exterior, exterior, exterior. Now when Rembrandt starts moving into his finding his own vision 
and his own metaphysical form world, it moves into a kind of cavern cavern space here. Um, and then so uh, Simeon and Anna in the temple. And 1627 is the year where he really starts finding his own unique style. The Rembrandt Brown here is thoroughly on the way. Uh, this is a version of the presentation that he re redoes pretty much all the way through down the line through his life. There are several other versions of the presentation in the temple. Um, it's almost as though a twilight is coming in, and, and we have that the, the closed cavern interior here. And then here is definitively Rembrandt finding his style, finding his color, the metaphysical brown with Paul in prison in uh, 1627. Paul always has the sword because, in a way, Paul is a sort of equivalent to Peter, whereas Peter, for Catholicism, is sort of the patron saint of images, whereas uh, in the Protestant North, Paul, the one who writes the earliest scriptures, the epistles, uh, is the uh, sort of uh, patron saint of the word. Uh, and so he has the sword of discrimination there on the left as his, uh, his attribute. And that sword... Uh, an equivalent of that would be found in uh, Buddhism with the Vajra, the, the thunderbolt that that uh, shatters ignorance concerning spiritual things and brings illumination, uh, as Paul does. Now here uh, is the iconotype. This is Caravaggio, 1602, Supper at Emmaus. And he does two of these, and it's an iconotype. Uh, it occurs... In the Gospels, where the, after he has, after Christ has been resurrected, he appears. He's with Luke and Cleopas, two, two disciples, and he appears with them. And um, they don't know who he is. Uh, he's a little bit like the angel in, in the Tobit story. They don't know who he is. But when he goes into this little cottage to have supper with them, he reveals himself and says, "I am Christ, the risen one." And then he just disappears, and they're astonished. And so Caravaggio emphasizes here with the dramatic arms on the right-hand side and the other disciple on the left here, uh, there's lots of movement. He has represented Christ sort of as an equilateral triangle. Uh, Caravaggio was a geometric thinker like Leonardo, who also represents him as, a, as an equilateral triangle in the Last Supper, except that it's slightly asymmetric here because his right hand is lifted as he makes the announcement. And he's also inserted a still life here. Uh, and so recall that in the introductory video, we saw the origins of the still life in Christian paintings, in Christian art, it gradually creeps its way in. So here it is uh, in the uh, <clears throat> Italian art. And then, uh, uh, so Caravaggio does a second one of these a couple of years later, 1606, uh, Supper at Emmaus, which is much darker and much less dramatic, uh, melodramatic. It's it's very calm, serene, and quiet. Now, so several painters imitate this. Uh, Rubens, uh, whose version of it I, I think is just about the weakest of the group. It's totally insipid, as most of the art of Rubens is. Rubens, uh, a lot of pretty images, but no thought, and uh, some, they're, they're very shallow, and there's just not much to Rubens. And in, in here, this painting, as far as I'm concerned, is completely inept. Um, 1616, uh, we have here, uh, in, uh, in Holland, we have a version of it here, 1616, Hendrik Terbruggen, um, not much to say about this really, but, uh, it, it circulated, um, and Rembrandt was well aware of it. Here's another one, another Dutch artist, Abraham Blomert, uh, again, uh, fit maybe for like a greeting card or something, it's, it's just, uh, Christian kitsch. And, um, but then we have this interesting thing here, this engraving, uh, Gout's engraving of Alzheimer's copper painting of Jupiter and Mercury going to visit uh, Philemon and Baucis. Philemon and Baucis was the couple that we saw in Act 5 of Goethe's uh, Faust Part 2. And here they are represented, and Jupiter is sitting on the right-hand side. And in the background on the far left, we see a, a figure in, inside the cottage here. Uh, not a terribly interesting image. Uh, but if you keep your eye on the Jupiter figure, then when Rembrandt in 1628 does his version of the supper at Emmaus, it's a total breakthrough, and it's better by far than any of these. There it is. Bam. That is a home run. And it's not a very big painting. Rembrandt had a tendency to paint small paint. He painted in all sizes, but there are lots of small paintings that you think would be large. 
simply because of the way he handles them. They look monumental, as does this one. It's not much bigger than a record album, let's say, an old-fashioned record album, maybe a little larger than that. It's not big. But notice what he does with Christ here. Um, he emphasizes, so Christ is supposed to disappear. So you're not supposed to be able to see him. How do you paint a disappearing Christ? So what he does is turn him into a shadow with this very sharp outline with a candle between him and the wall, if it is a candle. And to me, there's a metaphysical suggestion that there's actually a halo around him. But since we can't represent halos in 17th century Dutch art uh, without it turning into kitsch and being embarrassing, uh, the, the halo is suggested by the candlelight rather brilliantly. Christ is represented here more as a right-angled triangle than an equilateral one, as in the Caravaggio painting. And then we see that there's a disciple down below that can barely be made out. And the other one is, they're both completely astonished. Rembrandt doesn't bother much, focus much on the still life of, of the food on the table. And overturned a chair, it looks like here on the left-hand side. This is the Rembrandtian cave. So he, he likes the cave, the world of the dark Gothic interior that will soon become immense. And then he's got the figure uh, giving it the painting depth, which is brilliant with the woman in the kitchen doing dishes or making supper, whatever it is she's doing with a little candlelight to offset. And the three heads sort of make a diagonal, starting with Christ going to the left to the disciple and then going into the kitchen area with the woman. It sort of makes a rough diagonal. Uh, a fantastic painting. Scholars generally re regard uh, the, the repentant Judas returning the 30 pieces of silver as Rembrandt's first masterpiece, but I, I think it's this one, actually. I, I love this painting. Um, so then here's presentation of Jesus in the temple, 1628. Rembrandt is now off and running. No question about it. This is also a masterpiece as far as I'm concerned. Now that little abyss that we saw the, the shadow world in the on the left-hand side and the stoning of St. Stephen has slowly come in and devoured the entire foreground who just stand in a little clearing, a little lichtung, a Heideggerian space in which entities encounter each other and truths are made evident. But this giant, yawning, gothic cathedral of a background here uh, is becoming more and more the point. Spengler remarks at one point in The Decline of the Rest that you could almost even say that there is no foreground in a Rembrandt painting. The whole thing is background, infinite space. Um, and so the, now that he's found himself, uh, he's very confident now, so he does his first self-portrait, which is also brilliant, the way he handles that abyss. He actually puts the shadow now on his face so that you can't really make out his eyes, the top uh, half of his face, or his kind of bulbous nose uh, that is his visual trademark, and he's completely eliminated the background there. It's not even uh, just for the sake of the silhouette, sort of what he did with uh, the, the silhouette of, of Christ in the uh, Emmaus uh, painting. Here's another one that wasn't was recently found, not that long ago. Rembrandt laughing from the same year, 1628. Uh, you've he's got a few other paintings and etchings of him laughing, but not that many. And um, you won't see any smiles on his face uh, in his later uh, self portraits. Um, after all the tragedies and calamities that happened to him, with all the deaths of his children, with Saskia, with her death, with the woman suing him in 1649. Uh, and then him declaring bankruptcy in 1656. It was just one blow after the next. But he never fell out of favor. Uh, as Simon Shama tries to uh, get away with demonstrating, it, it's just not right. He never. He was always honored, always respected, had plenty of commissions. He was just a spendthrift. He couldn't hold on to his money. Um, and this is, uh, again, this is the artist in his studio, 1629, him being supremely self-confident. And so he's looking at his painting. Here he's standing, and we notice how short he was. He was a very short, plump, uh, not terribly attractive guy. And um, so we notice the stature there and the penetrating gaze looking at the canvas. The normal thing would be for uh, the painter to be sitting in a chair uh, painting this as his first pupil, um, uh, Gerard Gout, uh, or rather uh, uh, Gerard Doe, his, his first pupil, paints uh, a similar painting of a master sitting in front of an easel painting, so you can see what the standard practice was. Uh, but then he did do a sketch for this where he does show right here a chair. Uh, so there's a chair here, and the sketch, uh, this is now 1629. So, um, but I think he, 
it was very wise to eliminate the chair there. You can even see in the top space that gawning, that gothic yawning immensity up, up in the top there, even though it's only vaguely hinted at. Um, and then we have, so he sets up a studio with a, a rival slash friend of his, Jan Levens, who was regarded as, the, and the two of them were regarded, especially by their patron, Constantine Huygens, who was an art connoisseur and a patron, got them a lot of commissions. They were generally regarded as the two new up-and-coming artists in Leiden, which admittedly was still provincial. Nobody else really. Um, there had been uh, Lucas van Leiden, um, but these were regarded as essentially equivalent talents. They were not. As Kenneth Clark remarks, and I agree with him 100%, Levens was absolutely second-rate and a total mediocrity. It's a little bit like uh, Mozart and Salieri, uh, but they went back and forth painting some of the same iconotypes and trying to rival each other. And at every step, as you'll see here, Rembrandt simply uh, was better. Every one of his rivalries uh, results in a better painting. This is probably as close, as Simon Shama remarks, but probably as close as Levin's ever got. Um, it's not a bad painting. Pretty much everything in it works, but what spoils it for me is Christ. The sanctimonious way that he is represented here just spoils it. And I have to say that Levens did not understand human nature. He paints them with mawkish, embarrassing sentimentality, overacting, um, and kitsch. And then so here's uh, Rembrandt's painting. This dates from, it's a year earlier, 1630. So the Levens painting, 1631, was his attempt to rival this painting. Sorry, buddy, can't, not going to do it. Here's Christ. Uh, the, dr the drama is emphasized. Uh, the power of the resurrection. Lazarus slowly rising out of the crypt, like something out of a universal 1930s uh, horror, black and white horror film. Uh, spectacular painting. Much better than, than Levens by far. And then so we move to the issue of their rivalry with uh, painting Samson and Delilah. So here is Rubens' rather, once again, insipid, boring painting of Samson and Delilah from 1609. Here he represents Samson as a, as a hunk, a beefcake. Oh, Wow. And uh, it just isn't very well thought out or organized. Uh, Rubens had no intelligence. Now here's Jan Levens' version of it, which is catastrophically worse, and the worst of all of these. This is 1630, his Samson and Delilah. And it's just full of overacting, mawkish sentimentality and kitsch. Uh, it's pretty embarrassing. And then here we have also his um, Griselle panel, Levens, uh, from 1627 which pretty much very clearly uh, is the prototype, I think, for uh, um, Rembrandt's. But once again, and as Shama says here, I think he's very perceptive and very accurate most of the time, not always. But here I agree with him that this is B-movie silent film overacting. That's what's going on here. It's terrible. And then Rembrandt comes along and corrects the situation here, eliminates all the uh, mawkish overacting, and does something very, very ingenious with Delilah's hands. The hand on the right, or with, uh, yeah, with her hands, and then Samson is uh, lying in her lap there. The hand on the right is picking up the hair, because the Philistine soldier coming in has got the scissors in his hand that she's going to cut it with. But the other hand, the left hand, is tenderly caressing him. So she's ambivalent about him. Samson is the, uh, the Jewish equivalent of Gilgamesh. Gilgamesh. The story of Gilgamesh. Gilgamesh walks on the road of the sun god Shamash, and Samson is a transformation of the name Shamash. And it is a story about the mighty deeds of Gilgamesh, the, the lion slayer. Uh, Samson kills lions as well. Um, there isn't the hair motif in that story, where the hair in this story, uh, which is very important in the Semitic world, it got long hair and beards, that goes all the way back to the, the, the portrait, uh, the bronze portrait of Sargon of Akkad with the long shaggy beard and the long hair, as the Achilles heel, if, if it gets cut, he loses his power. So she cuts it, he does lose his power for a while, and he's out working, but it slowly grows back, and then he's capable of one final deed of killing a whole bunch of Philistines when he goes into their temple and shoves both the pillars down, crushing and killing everyone, including himself, which is, of course, uh, a variation of the myth of the procession of the equinoxes, where the pole star is knocked off its axis and causes the procession of one degree every 72 years through the Zodiac. And that, in the Gilgamesh story, is when occurs early in the tale when Gilgamesh and Enkidu cut down the cosmic cedar tree, which then causes an earthquake. Um, 
This painting may or may not be a masterpiece, but it's certainly better than Jan uh, Lievens. There's no question of that. And notice, too, that uh, Delilah, here's a chalk drawing f for it, that the Delilah, Samson, that Samson becomes uh, blind also. His eyes are put out. So there's the blindness motif again. Um, Rembrandt is just uh, fascinated with it, obsessed with it. Um, now here's the, so now we're at the, what all the scholars say is his first great masterpiece. And it is certainly uh, it, where he first really figures out his space, the spatial grouping. Here's the uh, uh, one of three chalk sketches for it. Judas returning uh, the pieces of silver or the proper title. Here it is, 1629, Repentant Judas Returning the 30 Pieces of Silver. And really, in many ways, I can see why scholars would say that, although I, I think, as we've said, Emmaus is, is the first masterpiece. This one's damn good, though, and very well organized and staged. The geometry is excellent. The lighting is there, the metaphysical Rembrandt Brown, and, the, and his patron, Constantine Huygens, lost his shit over this painting. He went crazy. You, you compared it to the best of any of the Italian masters, anything Italy has ever produced. He really enthused about it. Um, and he really, especially like the figure of Judas here, who is repentant, he is the, the lower figure on the right-hand side, wringing his hands, throwing the 30 silver pieces. 30, by the way, is tied with a lunar cycle, and the silver is also the metal of the moon. So he goes and hangs himself. He uh, is the sort of dying god. But without his deed, uh, the whole death and resurrection of Christ would not have happened. So in a way, it's absolutely a fortunate deed. And I want to finish just by glancing in that respect at uh, Albrecht Dürer's version of The Last Supper, or one of them, uh, a woodcut from 1510, in which he features, notice that the window on the top is in the shape of a crescent moon, uh, turned upside down, but it's deliberately meant to represent a moon. Uh, so Dürer knew very well the connection between the sil silver coins of Judas and the moon. And there's Christ grabbing him, uh, and as though forcing him, I know you don't want to do this to me, but you have to do it for the sake of the whole cosmic drama of uh, salvation, of, re of redemption of humanity through my sufferings on the cross. You must betray me. This is an assignment. And on the tr plate before Judas, notice that there's a dead pig on it. The pig, when it has tusks, is associated with the crescent moon by way of the tusks. And the pig is always associated with the underworld, with the openings of the abyss of the underworld that Judas uh, in betraying Christ, will open up uh, for Christ. The descent into hell, the harrowing of hell, and then the ascent. Um, so it's an assignment. So I, I think that there are ways of looking at the Judas uh, betrayal, unconventional ways, which, which show a much larger mythological story going on there. All right, that's it for this uh, period here of uh, Rembrandt's career, the, the first period. So...